Hello, my name is Heidi Matson, and I am the discussion group coordinator and a member of the student advisory board at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program. Discussion groups are made possible by Newman's Own Foundation and this spring series is presented in partnership with the Kosovo American Education Fund and Gashi's residency is made possible with the support of the Jim Jema Opportunity Fund. Today's program will be live streamed and available on our YouTube channel. You can also ask, access videos of past Dole Institute programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. After the program, we will have some time for audience questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please ask just one brief question. For virtual viewers, you can send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase the, your questions with this in mind and ask just one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And before we hand things over to Dr. Gashi, here's a special video from an alumna from the Kosovo American Education Fund. Hello everyone, I'm Tevuta Avdimitai and I'm KF alumna of class of 2017. I'm very grateful for the KF scholarship because it made it possible for me to study international security at Georgetown University. Living and studying in the US has been a truly life-changing experience for me. Uh, I was able to obtain one of the best educations available in the field of security studies while also making a lifetime friendship and expanding my uh, professional network. After finishing my graduate studies, I was excited to come back to Kosovo and to give back, uh, primarily uh, as part of the Office of the President of Kosovo, then the think tank community, and more recently uh, now as part of the higher education system. Without a doubt, uh, KF has been instrumental for my personal and professional growth, and it continues to be one of the most transformative and impactful projects for the development of our country. I would like to thank all of those who have contributed to KF throughout these years, and I would like to use this opportunity to invite all of those who can to continue supporting KF and its important mission. Thank you. Join me in welcoming Spring Fellow Chendram Gashi. Thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome again at the Dole Institute, where uh, we will continue uh, our discussion, the series of discussions on building democracy in the 21st century, focusing on Kosovo. Our uh, guest today is indeed a very special one. Um, I was her advisor back in 2011, and uh, uh, she's the first uh, five-star general of Kosovo's police force. She's the first woman president of the Republic of Kosovo. She's the youngest head of state, uh, female head of state elected democratically in the world. Um, she has been active throughout her presidency to promote women's rights, uh, to engage youth in decision-making processes, to strengthen democracy and, and security, both in Kosovo and in the region, in the Western Balkans. Uh, she is an inspiration to not only many young girls, but also boys and men and women in Kosovo and beyond. Uh, and so I'm very honored to have as our guest, as my guest, uh, Madam Atifete Yahyaga, President of the Republic of Kosovo from 2011 until 2016. Thank you, Madam President, for accepting to come to uh, at the Dole Institute and here in Kansas. It's a, it's a real honor to be here with you. Yeah. James, thank you very much. And um, thank you for uh, having me at the uh, Dole Institute. Thank you to Audrey, to Kaif, and to all of the friends that I was able to meet uh, this afternoon while I'm here in uh, uh, Kiev, which I'm really impressed with uh, everything what this institute has been doing, and they couldn't have a better fellow than having you here and with your background, Chandra. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I would like to ask some questions that start before you became president. I mentioned already you were uh, the first 
five-star general in Kosovo's police force. Um, why did you choose to serve in the security sector? Because that's not a natural choice for, 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 for many, many people. And uh, how did your family react to that? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, Chandrim, I find very unusual that uh, like uh, 11 years after we are switching the roles and uh, uh, I was 11 years ago posing the questions to Chandrim, and now he's posing the questions yes. to me. So the t world changes for the very good things. Uh, well, um, Chandrim, it um, it was a very long. Uh, 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 it is a very long story behind that, why I have actually chosen to uh, join to the uh, security uh, sector, uh, to join to an, an organization which was uh, uh, seen as uh, only the environment, uh, only for men, and particularly coming from a country and from the region where uh, it is a very patriarchal society uh, that uh, certain jobs and the function are uh, reserved only for the men, but not for the uh, women. Uh, but I think the main reason behind that was uh, that uh, I, myself, and to a certain point you, uh, but definitely the, uh, the uh, fellows from my generation and one generation uh, before me, uh, we got to use to live into the very uh, hardship circumstances. Uh, I was born into the, uh, during the civil resistance time. Uh, I did throughout my entire education, primary, secondary, and the university uh, degree under the Milosevic uh, regime. And every time that we have seen the uniform and the police and the military, which in the uh, normal democracies and other countries around the world, it's uh, the uniform is there to protect you, to serve you. Uh, while in our case, it was the other way around, where every time that we see the uniform, uh, we've seen uh, the beating, we've seen the prosecution, we've seen the imprisonment, uh, and even uh, the uh, 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 killing and assassination in uh, uh, in uh, total, and so after the end of the war, uh, I uh, I was a gradu young graduated lawyer. I started working for the United Nations mission in uh, Kosovo, and that time we were building the all of the and creating the sub laws and the laws uh, to uh, uh, to establish the new police organization immediately after the uh, end of the war. And for the first time, we were introducing the gender element uh, uh, to uh, within the Kosovo police, where before the women uh, were only in administration part, but not within the uh, active uniform uh, and operational side of the uh, police and the uh, military. And uh, so uh, somehow it was very much tempting for me to kind of to be a part of that organization, which is which is a, which was about to start it from. Uh, scratch, but more to that, that the first women who have started joining to the uh, uh, police organization, they have been uh, followed with uh, 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 bad comments by the general public that you need to belong, yeah, you need to belong to the lower ranks of the society and uh, no educational background in order to join to the uh, uh, police organization. And definitely that was not the situation in real. And so I wanted to contribute to uh, join to this organization uh, by helping to increase the percentage of the women, uh, educated women, to join to the police organization with the idea that I would uh, serve there for maybe two or three years, help uh, increase the percentage of the women and step back and continue uh, serving to my career, which I started as uh, in the uh, law background. Uh, but I got stuck there uh, for about 15 <laughs> years. Uh, without knowing, because slowly I start rosing uh, throughout the ranks. And when you asked me about how was the reaction of the family, uh, to uh, my surprise, um, I was lucky. I cannot say that the majority of the women in Kosovo, but particularly in the southeastern part of the Europe, had uh, the luck and the privilege that I had to be raised by a family in general, but particularly from a father. Uh, that believed in equal rights for me and my brother. Uh, 
uh, and maybe sometimes even much more rights for myself than for my uh, brother that was uh, a year and a half uh, older than I was, that he chosen the profession which was uh, maybe 100% more uh, 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 financially uh, more burning for my family than it was my profession. He was in the medicine while I was in, uh, in a law. Uh, but my father and his family, his entire family, uh, because um, uh, my family's background, it comes from the very rational family, uh, where uh, they have been uh, prosecuted by the state of the uh, Rankovich and the Milosevic for the decades in a row. And uh, so mainly because they given the rights, more rights to the uh, a majority and to the more marginalized community that they, they supposed to be uh, given, particularly towards the women. And so uh, I did have a huge support from my family in general. Uh, my mom did resist in the beginning, mainly because of the perception of the people or the pressure of the perception of the people. Uh, but I did enjoy huge support from my father and I am forever grateful. I am the person that I am here today with you uh, uh, just because I had the father like uh, I had uh, starting from my early uh, uh, childhood. And uh, uh, when I'm here in there, uh, when I'm in this topic, I try to always encourage, particularly the young parents, that they have to raise with equal uh, standards boys and girls because there is where they start getting the first elements, what they're really going to be in the near future. Um, and um, it is fair to say that, of course, you were extremely successful uh, in the Kosovo police force. And but part of this success is also due to uh, to your training that you uh, obtained uh, in in various uh, parts of the world, including the FBI. So <laughs> you know this is a you know a tough uh, Kosovo uh, general uh, who then becomes uh, the first uh, president, a woman president of uh, the Republic of Kosovo. Um, so you already broke barriers uh, in the police force, uh, but this time you really managed to uh, crack that uh, glass ceiling in we Kosovo. Smashed it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, um, and that's the right expression <laughs> here in Kansas with the, you know, with the basketball <laughs> being so famous. Um, you, you, you already embodied that uh, sense of equality, gender equality and, and, and women's rights in your um, uh, career. You mentioned the support that you uh, got in your family, but how did you transmit that vision that you had for women's rights and gender equality and inclusion of, of, of youth um, when you became president? Because suddenly you were no longer just the person embodying a, a vision, you also were able to implement that vision. Yeah. Uh, well, Chandrim, I got elected as the president in a very unusual circumstances, as you already uh, know, being, first of all, the Kosovar uh, citizen, but uh, later on serving as uh, one of my close collaborators and uh, uh, staff members within the Ayahuasca presidency 2011-2016. Uh, uh, Six months before I was elected as the president of Kosovo, two presidents were ruled on by the Constitutional Court for the violation of the uh, Constitution. And uh, we were in a very deep political uh, crisis, uh, not only the two presidents were ruled down by the Constitutional Court, but within the year we have overcome two rounds of the, of the parliamentary uh, elections uh, with a huge uh, uh, local and international mo monitoring uh, system put in uh, place. And till that level of the international reporting of the, uh, of the fabricated fat theft of the votes. Uh, so starting from that time, 2009 and 2000, 2010, and till today's day where Kosovo is being ranked one of the most advanced system of the hosting and uh, keeping the uh, elections, uh, country has gone through the huge positive transformation for, for less than a decade uh, uh, time. And that time, uh, the three main political parties, uh, uh, they came up with a proposal to nominate uh, the consensual uh, candidate for the first time, like you mentioned, 
and uh, non-partisan uh, uh, candidate, uh, which uh, uh, in a way I always say like it took three men uh, to uh, nominate a woman to come and fix the mess that they have created for a couple of years in a row. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, so to my uh, uh, surprise, uh, I was elected uh, on the first round of the elections with over third, uh, with over 80 percent of the uh, uh, votes, uh, by making me, like you said, uh, the first woman to be elected into the highest position in Kosovo in the southeastern part of the uh, Europe, the youngest head of state democratically uh, uh, elected. Uh, but uh, Chandrim, I did not realize, and even today, when I try to reflect in the times uh, uh, behind, uh, I still, I could not even imagine the uh, challenges that I was about to face the very first moment uh, that I took the, over the uh, office. Uh, there was never a talk and the, uh, or uh, I, I would be more than happy if the people would be kind of like measuring my uh, success or lack of the success based on my process of the decision making or based on my roles and responsibilities, constitutional roles and responsibilities. Uh, but with more of the talk, what is she wearing today, what kind of the high hairstyle she's having today, uh, what kind of the heels, what kind of the bags, what kind of the nail polish. So maybe about the 10 headlines, uh, the first 10 headlines in Kosovo were about this one, and maybe somewhere in the 11 or the 12th headline was about, wait a second, what is she talking about today? What kind of the decisions she has been taking today? And so, but I have expected, but not up into that uh, uh, level level in there. And so I had a couple of the main rules when I took over the uh, office where you have been a part of that. My first rule was that, that I'm not going to allow any interference whatsoever uh, to be involved within the office of the president, like used to be till the time that I have uh, taken over by other powers within uh, the uh, country, mainly from the political uh, parties. My second rule was that I'm going to have a majority of the population of Kosovo to be represented in the office of the president of uh, Kosovo, when you speak about the inclusiveness, that 61% of the population of Kosovo, my dear ladies and gentlemen, are under the age of the 30. So I wanted the same representation to be represented within the office, the cabinet of the president of uh, Kosovo. 51% of the population of Kosovo are my own kind, are the women of Kosovo. And I wanted the exactly the same percent to be represented within the office of the uh, president. And into the process of the decision making, I kind of, and we kind of, Chandrip, have ex extended that table of the decision making. And we have added more chairs for all the ones that has been for far too long left outside of the decision-making process, but at the same time, they had to be living with the outcomes or uh, the results of our process of the decision-making. So I added more chair, uh, chairs for women, for minority community, and for the marginalized communities. Um, so I can actually testify. I was there uh, when a Madam President was elected, and I served at the beginning, and, and I could not believe the level of sexism that I was seeing um, uh, in the media, uh, th you know, there was never a focus on policy. It was more a focus, as, as Madam President said, on, 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 on caricatures. Um, you mentioned that uh, uh, this is, I get the opportunity to ask questions now, and I'm really thankful to Audrey and the Dole Institute. Uh, so uh, therefore, I have a question, which is, uh, I think not many people back at home know about this, but is it true that you have defeated in swimming, when you were president, a sitting prime minister? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so. How the hell do you know this? <laughs> I well, got my sources. <laughs> oh gosh, now I know why he was my, my, my advisor there. Yes, it's true. Um, <laughs> do, do you want to reveal to us who that prime minister uh, was? <laughs> Uh, yes, it was the uh, former Prime Minister of Albania. And um, it was one of the very few times that I was able to grab uh, 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 two days or three days of the uh, summer holidays uh, to leave and to be able to spend a little bit of time with my uh, family. And uh, 
I used to swim a lot before. I cannot say it for now. And so I did not realize that uh, I was posing the challenge uh, for the Secret Service, uh, but never thinking that posing the challenge to the sitting prime minister at that time. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was getting into the, uh, into the water and uh, getting out of the water like four hours after. So I was doing like miles of the swimming from one corner to another corner. And so one day the Secret Service uh, from my team and the Secret Service of the team of the Prime Minister were sitting each other, sitting with each other, a complaint like, like, oh, the Prime Minister goes for swimming and he comes back after two hours. And the team that was escorting me said like, oh boy, it's nothing than being with, in the team with Yayaga because the water is not only above the skin, but it's under the skin <laughs> uh, for us. And uh, so uh, apparently, uh, uh, so uh, one of the day he invites me for coffee and I said like, uh, we don't have to drive, you can just start swimming from your side where you are sitting and I can start from the side where I am staying. And so we can meet each other somewhere in between. Yeah, and, 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 and by the way, it's, it's interesting, the dynamic is interesting because the Albanian Prime Minister, he had built sort of this reputation in the media and everyone in the media knows that he was a, gr a great swimmer. They did not know that we actually had uh, a better swimmer <laughs> in Kosovo, so that's that's why I'm mentioning this. Thanks um, God we didn't, because <laughs> the <laughs> media's were hunting me to get me somewhere in the bathing suit. <laughs> and so I have one more one more you know type of question uh, of of this sort before we get into more policy uh, discussions. Um, uh, so uh, again, I've done some research, and it appears that you were a great. Uh, Marks person or, sh uh, or, or a sharp shooter, so Boy. nobody could actually defeat Madam President. In, uh, and I'm, you know, we're not armed here. Don't worry. Uh, but uh, so, how did you actually handle that? Because uh, there is this very famous photo in Kosovo, <laughs> where uh, President Yahyaga is holding a gun, and uh, and again, this is breaking many barriers in in the image of of people who thought that guns are just for men. And, uh, and so, you know, could, could you tell us a little bit about your experience, uh, what you can share about uh, uh, in the FBI? Well, <laughs> yeah, there is that dominator that the guns are for uh, men's, uh, but to be handled better for, by women. <laughs> uh, yes, actually, uh, I was in the top of a generation uh, in Kosovo, in the Kosovo police. Uh, we have this... Uh, a rule that is like uh, 60 rounds, and out of the 60, I had 59 in number 10 uh, from all distances. And so I think this was more on in, in my genes because uh, my father, he used to be uh, the second uh, in during his army service in the former Yugoslavia. And, but I never ever handled the weapon uh, till after the end of the war when I joined to the uh, uh, security organizations. And uh, so um, I kind of like continued to, uh, to build into that uh, skill. Even now when I have a free time, I go to the shooting range and uh, I particularly uh, take a lot of women from Kosovo and uh, uh, go there because uh, it is a different effect that has on you when you are handling uh, a, a, a weapon, and it's in it's a type like it's a different type of the empowerment that, that you come out of that uh, uh, therapy under the backers that <laughs> I kind of use it in my term there. So we will we will remain in the issues uh, related to security, and um, when you were uh, president, one of the issues that you tackled head on. Uh, was the issue of uh, violent extremism. And you were known in the entire region and, and beyond, actually, to have been one of the first leaders that took concrete actions early on. Because yeah. at some point, you know, there were many who joined forces, but you, you did that uh, early on. And did the fact that you had this background in security help you? Uh, or what was your outlook? How did you evaluate this, this danger that was facing Kosovo and, and the entire world? Well, Chandram, um, neither Kosovo, neither US, neither any other country in the world can be or could be uh, or will be immune uh, facing with the global challenges. 
neither Kosovo uh, could be immune uh, back in 2013 and 2014, where uh, the rest of the uh, Europe and the southeastern part of the Europe or the Western Balkans have been facing uh, with uh, the uh, violent uh, extremism. Yes, indeed, Kosovo was the very first country in our part of the region and much wider to your, towards within the EU that has given the bold response on tackling the uh, violent uh, extremism. Uh, within a couple of uh, days, and no, definitely this did not relate to my background uh, as uh, the uh, former five-star uh, general of the uh, Kosovo police. That was purely uh, the task of the president, who is, uh, which, which was my constitutional obligation, because uh, Kosovo, as you know, is a parliamentary democracy, where the executive powers fall under the, uh, uh, the government, legislative under the parliament, while the national security and the foreign policy and the, the uh, certain judicial uh, uh, competence fall under the president. So that was purely national security uh, issue. And so it was uh, my obligation, my constitutional obligation uh, to step in and give a very bold uh, response uh, towards the violent extremism. And we were uh, the very first country at the global level uh, that uh, even uh, uh, actually before we took, uh, took uh, on the proper actions, uh, no matter the Kosovo, it at that time was one, uh, about 1.9 million population. We had the highest percentage uh, of the uh, foreign fighters per capita which were going outside of the Kosovo to fight in Iraq, in Syria, and other countries. And I simply did not want it, that trend to be dominating Kosovo in the region of the southeastern part of the Europe. So for the first time, Kosovo has given a very bold response. Uh, Within one joint operation, we have arrested about 80% of the foreign fighters which were present in uh, Kosovo. For the first time, we have shut down uh, the illegal mosques operating in Kosovo illegal NGOs who were sub, uh, uh, financially supporting the, uh, the um, and in a way infiltrating the people within as the foreign uh, uh, fighters and in indoctrinating uh, people. And we have also uh, uh, kind of like tracked down all of the illegal finances that was coming in order to support uh, those kind of the uh, activities. So within a couple of days, the whole situation was brought into the, con uh, which, uh, which was brought under the control. And and to my surprise, there are much bigger countries within the European Union that has immediately contacted our intelligence services and others in order to get the uh, best examples or the doing uh, or knowing how to do and how to act in Kosovo in order to copy and uh, to adopt it within their countries and within their organization, and particularly into the sharing of the inf information intelligence, how to tackle this uh, phenomena. So I'm really happy happy that I was able to act in the timing that we acted. Otherwise, I would not even imagine the consequences if we would only delay it for about 24 hours of action there. Mm. So that's, I think, a, a sign of, of real uh, leadership. And, uh, and um, I, I'm assuming that uh, the, the close U.S.-Kosovo relationship and as a matter of fact, Sroy Chandra, yeah. and when we took in these actions, uh, Kosovo uh, uh, we just overcome the parliamentary election. We had a no government in place and we had no parliament in place. Uh, so uh, we were act, uh, acting with the acting government and no parliament in place. And so it was one of the most difficult circumstances for me personally as the president to manage uh, during the uh, August of 2014. Yes, I, I, and, and just for, for some context, of course, whenever you take bold uh, decisions, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's easier to spread the responsibility around, but, uh, but in this case, uh, it took uh, a, a real leadership for, for, from yourself. Um, I would like now to, to mention the U.S.-Kosovo relationship, because one of the areas in which uh, this relationship has been really evolving and, and deepening over the years is security. Um, but uh, the relationship uh, between the United States and Kosovo is multifold. And, and of course, we're here at the Dole Institute and, and the late Senator Dole being one of the early supporters of, of Kosovo. 
um, in um, late 80s, early 90s. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you see the U.S. Kosovo relationship, how it has evolved over the years? Well, I couldn't. I wouldn't think of the better place uh, to um, uh, to reflect or to celebrate the extraordinary uh, relation uh, between Kosovo and the U.S. than here in the uh, Dole Institute, uh, like you mentioned, where uh, the uh, base of that are uh, many decades uh, uh, before that we even uh, are here uh, uh, today, and. Um, U.S. has been and continues to be one of the greatest allies and the supporters of the uh, people of Kosovo and the uh, country of Kosovo. Um, U.S. and the people of the United States have been with us in the most trying times, I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, during the civil resistance uh, by not only bringing to the surface of the administration of this country about uh, the geography where Kosovo is physically, where we're about uh, the major violation of the human rights which are happening almost in the heart of the uh, Europe. And I always recall a very strong word of the uh, Secretary Albright that she mentioned a few days after the liberation of Kosovo when uh, she came to welcome the first troops of the NATO uh, uh, in Kosovo, when she mentioned that if we did not act now, the history will not forgive us. I wouldn't be here, and I think I mentioned this morning uh, uh, during some, some events today, that I wouldn't be here as a living human being with you or you with me here with this uh, audience if the United States of America and the leadership of this country wouldn't be there for us uh, before the 90s, after the 90s, uh, till the time that we declared our independence and being the strong ally and a friend and a supporter even after the declaration of the independence of uh, 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 Kosovo. And this is in all, uh, 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 it, it's spread around, not only at a political level, but at a diplomatic level, at the military and others. And so there is no more pro-American uh, uh, country in the world than is Kosovo and our Albanian people in, uh, 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 in, uh, gen in general. And you know, Chandrin, uh, we have the statue and the, uh, and the boulevard of the President uh, Clinton uh, which is just like a couple of hundreds uh, uh, meters further with uh, the uh, statue of the uh, of Senator Dahl and with the statue of the, uh, uh, of the Secretary uh, Albright. And so this is the way how we uh, uh, show our appreciation and our gratitude what this nation and this country has been uh, doing for us. Uh, but I want to say that we are still in the halfway. We still have a not fulfilled what uh, Kosovo needs to be and where we should be, because we all know what is the final and should be the final destination of Kosovo. The full EU membership in the peace with all of its, its uh, uh, neighbors and the full membership into the NATO. And the U.S. has to play and should be playing a crucial ro role on moving our country and our uh, region in that direction. Um, so. Early on, uh, we, you, you referenced, uh, and in this answer, um, the, the plight of Kosovo, the terrible aspects of, uh, of the war was that, uh, unfortunately, uh, there were thousands of uh, women and, and some men uh, that uh, were uh, survivors of uh, sexual violence during the war. And uh, you um, uniquely uh, Exercised not only your duties as a president, but also your compassion as 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 a as a person, to try to uh, support support them. And uh, I would like to mention here that uh, um, the first time that uh, Madam President went to meet with some of these survivors, she uh, in order to make sure that she protects their identity, she actually uh, drove herself without her security detail. To make sure that n nobody would uh, uh, would see her, and this, you know, you went to lengths back then, and you have been doing so continuously with your foundation. Um, why is it that you you wanted to support this cause and you wanted to support these women? Uh, well, Chandrema, 
when I speak about the survivors of the sexual violence, being that 12 years ago, when I first came across with the survivors, uh, or today, I become more than, more than emotional. Why? Uh, because it could happen to me. It could happen to my mother. I was in my early 20s. My mother was in early 40s. 24 years ago, we have inherited a country which has been totally destroyed. Not only from the infrastructure point of view, but also from the human side of it. Over 13,000 people killed and massacred. Over one million people made by force to leave the country for the purpose of the ethnic cleansing, just because you are Kosovo Albanian. Still, till today's day, children, we are speaking about over 1,600 people missing in different massive graves, where we don't know. I have a family members which are missing in different massive graves. At the same time, with a denial from our northern neighbor of Serbia to cooperate with the institutions of Kosovo or the international community to share where the statistics, data, and the maps of the remains of our loved ones are. And an estimated number of 20,000 women and men raped during the war time, where rape has been used as a tool of war. To our shame, as a people of Kosovo, well, we have taken our institutional and the social responsibility towards all categories of the war. Somehow, we left the survivors of the se sexual violence under the mercy of no one, covering them with a veil of shame, pointing the finger towards them that it's your fault, you ask for it, just because of our very male and macho dominant society because it did not happen to us. It could not happen to us. And so this topic, it's close to the public. It happened, but in case did not happen. It was exactly the first two weeks in my term as the president that I met a group of the 36 women from the Drenica area. That Chandrim has changed me forever as a person, as a woman of that society. I met a woman that she was only 47 years old when she was raped. She was a mother of three daughters. She was raped with, together with three other daughters. The older daughter was only 17 years old. The middle daughter was 13. And the youngest one, seven years old, with a Down syndrome. I met women that they were all their bodies, they had the marks of the cuts of the knives. Sorry to the gentlemen in these rooms cut the breasts, four S's, you know what are the symbol of the four S's. That's the Serbian national symbol. Their symbol. That they had cuts in their stomachs, and when the wounds did not properly healed, so you can only imagine the marks. Throughout their legs, they had the marks of the shots of the cigarettes throughout their bodies. So their torts were removed by force in there. So I simply could not believe that that has happened to the women of Kosovo. That moment, I made a promise to those women that I will not leave a stone unturned before each and every one's voice is going to be heard and their sacrifice. I went against the general public of Kosovo because you know what I've gone through at that time. The government was not supporting me. The parliament was not supporting me.
It was an unpopular topic in Kosovo. I was keep receiving advices from all political elites in Kosovo. Don't start this topic, President, because we are going to eat you out. This is closed chapter for us. While I was saying this chapter is about to open now, 15 years after the end of the war, to our shame, we kept the survivors to live with the traumas and the horrification that what has happened to them. So it took me a couple of years to be able to analyze thoroughly my competencies because the political elites at that time, they were hardly waiting to send me to the Constitutional Court and to discharge me from the position. Not that I really wanted to keep that because I was already sick of that position. <laughs> but I, I just started something that I didn't want myself to be stopped, which was not necessarily my competence as the president. I initiated the law. Actually, I created the National Council for the Survivors of the Sexual Violence, the only case in the world to be led by the president, to be established with a presidential degree, which I brought around the same decision-making uh, table. Government, parliament, international community, women organization, which were from the very beginning very much supporting me, and I am forever grateful to them that they were the only one that has supported, that later on even the government start rallying out there. The women activists, media, uh, main diplomats uh, present in Kosovo, in there. And from the first day, I made all the pu meetings public and to be publicly broadcasted. All the meetings were all, no matter if it lasts for one hour, two hours, five hours, or 10 hours. Because I wanted for everyone was, which was against that to be able to be facing with a public shame. These are the ones which are trying to victimize more the survivors of the sexual violence. For the first time in the history of Kosovo, the survivors of the sexual violence got protected by law as the civilians victims of the war, where their identity is being protected from the beginning of the process till the end of the process. Their habilitation, reintegration, resocialization, and access to the me free medical services and access to the justice. When we speak about the tackling of the culture of impunity and the access of the justice, can you believe, Chandran, that for 24 hour years after the end of the war, we have only one perpetrator that has been brought in the front of the justice and got minimum of the sentence for the three rapes that he has done? Why? Because one way the international community did not pay the proper attention that we're supposed to be paying immediately after the end of the war related to the evidence, because they always justify towards me, oh, Madam President, there is not enough evidence. What kind of the evidence you need for the rape cases when you have exactly the victim or the survivor of that particular uh, uh, crime, which is they are still living and they are among uh, us in there and at the same time facing with a denial of the Serbia to cooperate with the institutions of Kosovo or the international community because all of the survivors, they know with certain exception who has done that one. I personally met over 8,000 survivors of the sexual violence throughout Kosovo. There's not even a single day per week that I don't travel in one place or village around Kosovo to meet one survivor and to talk to them. And do you know, children and my dear ladies and gentlemen, one thing that always keep being mentioned by their side towards me, every time I ask, is anything more that we can do for you? It's like whoever has done this to us to be facing with a justice. Because for us, we don't have a peace in our heart and mind before we see whoever done this would be facing with a justice. They remember them by face, by nicknames, by their tattoos, uh, by left uh, IDs in the crime, uh, where, where the, the crime has been uh, conducted.
they know that because they have been their neighbors, other people. So all of them, they know who has done these uh, crimes. But we have been failing and failing again to provide what is very basic, the justice for those uh, uh, crimes. While each and every one of us have enjoyed our liberty, freedom, and independence, in the hearts and minds of those survivors, there is still war like it happened yesterday. So, so you have demonstrated that your, uh, your public service does not end when your term ends. And in 2016, uh, you, your term ended as the president of the Republic of Kosovo, but you established later uh, the Yahyaga Foundation, which has actually uh, uh, taken on uh, an, an important role to tackle some of these issues and others. Um, and this is going to be the last question before we open uh, the floor to the audience. Um, we, have, we have some students here. We have some uh, students, uh, no doubt, watching us. Um, I would like to know, what did you dream of when you were a student? What <laughs> Definitely not being a president. <laughs> So, so the yeah. message is you don't have to dream of becoming a president in order to become one. <laughs> but uh, well, but I, 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 want, I want you to rec reconnect us to your, to your student years. Uh, I would like to know, because it's, it's interesting. And, and then just you know, uh, walk us back to that moment, please. Yeah. Uh, well, do you want me first to answer the question about the foundation and later on for this one? I'll, I'll ask the foundation later. <laughs> later on. Well, um, I do know that this is supposed to be more of the motivational kind of like talk and so. Uh, but <laughs> my, my student years are not regular student years, like you actually have. My student years were more kind of like uh, hiding from one location to another location. Uh, and <laughs> My routine going to uh, 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 from the secondary school and the uh, then and the university uh, was that uh, I left home seven o'clock in the morning and I came back seven or eight o'clock in the morning in the evening. Why? Because I had to do one class, uh, for example, in Sunny Hill, where I live today. And uh, to go to the second class, I had to walk for 45 minutes to go to Vranjevs. From Vranjevs to go to Dragodan for another 40 minutes. From Dragodan to go to Dubrovniki Street, which is it was another uh, one hour walk. And uh, so because uh, we were, uh, because of the uh, Milosevic repression system, we were made by force to leave our schools, like our parents were made by force to leave their jobs, and uh, everything we were operating into the parallel system, education, health, and uh, other, uh, that was, we were working in the parallel system. And uh, I had to hide books in my stomach, in the backside. We were not allowed even to take the backpacks uh, because uh, we were hiding for the, from the police of the uh, Milosevic regime. I was personally once uh, laying down in the ground and having the poo -poo boot of the police officer on my neck while my brother was beaten to death with his friends while he was coming uh, uh, back uh, from his uh, uh, classes because they found the medical books in, uh, uh, in his back. And uh, so it's not one of the best memories uh, 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 for me, uh, uh, Chandrim. Uh, but uh, yes, we had these times where uh, we were uh, organizing this union events, hiding from one location uh, to another location. I was always dreaming that uh, I want to continue uh, to uh, my studies for the criminology, which was never available in Kosovo. The only place available uh, in our close neighborhood was in uh, Croatia and in uh, uh, Slovenia. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, my father was a big supporter of me, and uh, 
he had that moment that he was about to uh, sell all of his property so he can give me all of the money. And he was about to resign his job to join me uh, because of that time to allow a woman to go alone to be educated, like, no, 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 that is not happening in Kosovo. And uh, so then it was just one year before the war has started in, uh, in Kosovo, and I decided it is not the right timing to continue for the criminology. I will see for a better momentum, and it would be really unfair to leave uh, my entire family to sold the property, uh, to rent the place where we are going to live, and nobody what, uh, will know what was going to happen. And so uh, that's why I kind of like changed my, uh, 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 my kind of like a vision, what I'm going to do with uh, myself, without knowing that uh, after the war, I will be joined to the security in a different uh, uh, perspective. But I don't know that feeling, how is to go to the prom evenings, uh, to wear a nice dress, and yeah, Yes, I did wear the nice uh, dress, but I did not end up to go to the prom, prom evening uh, <laughs> because the police came one hour before to that venue where we supposed to have the uh, celebration and event and uh, destroyed everything. And so then we just gathered in uh, some of my friends' places. And so it's not one of the best memories, but still when we reflect to that time, gosh, our generation now has everything and they still don't really know how to enjoy that. So I regret and I wish I could turn the time back. And the God knows what kind of a spoiler I will be, but anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> so this, is, this is extremely uh, remarkable, and I, I really appreciate uh, you sharing with us uh, these, these personal experiences, which I think are inspirational um, for, for many people, not just in the audience, but uh, elsewhere as well, and, and the remarkable progress that Kosovo, despite the challenges, has made. Uh, and y I think you're, you're a living example of that. Now is, is the time for uh, questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. For virtual uh, viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. Please ask just one brief question Please phrase your questions with this in mind and ask just one brief question. Thank you. Uh, I see someone over there. Hello. Uh, so your government, you have a very young country. You said 61% were under the age of 30. And you made your cabinet representative of that. Now, a lot of uh, more well-known governments around the world are for countries that have much older demographics in general. Do you think those places would also benefit from having younger representation in government, even if it's different from the actual demographics of the country? Um, absolutely. We definitely, uh, we need to start placing much more trust in the future generation and in the young generation. Uh, because the future is in your hands. Definitely is not no matter that I'm still young by age, uh, but definitely is not in, even in our hands. Uh, the reason why I have established the Yaga Foundation because we left that question without being answered, and I want to connect with your uh, uh, question there is, it is exactly the reason why I established the Yaga Foundation to continue uh, giving the platform to the young people of Kosovo, or not meaning that that platform is not being given toward by the current governments, because we have been seeing some major positive transition and transformation uh, within uh, these past 24 years of uh, uh, Kosovo, and particularly with these latest uh, governments, by giving more chances and more opportunities towards the women, towards the young people, and towards the marginalized uh, uh, communities. Parliament of Kosovo today has over 46% of the women represented into the parliament, which is the highest percentage that Kosovo ever had or any other country in the region of the southeastern part of the Europe. And trust me, over 40% of those women 
would be in the parliament with or without the quota. And the top five women voted for the parliament are the most voted uh, uh, from out of 120 members of the uh, uh, parliament. And we have uh, much more with the women in the parliament of Kosovo as the deputy prime ministers, ministers, vice ministers, but also with the group age, we have uh, much more the younger people, which are the ministers, uh, the, with the deputy ministers, mayors of a municipality. So we are seeing that they are, we are trying continuing to build into this uh, good and the positive change that Kosovo has uh, tried. But also in the close neighborhood, I see this is happening. Though with a lot of hesitation, not many other countries are copying uh, into that. And the reason why I established the Hegaka Foundation was, first of all, uh, to send a direct or indirect uh, uh, message towards the political elites in Kosovo and the region that there is a life after leaving the highest office. If you really want to continue uh, using that moral authority that you build while you are in the office to continue pressing in the topics which are very dear to my uh, to your heart for me for example despite of my constitutional obligation uh, things which were very dear to my heart were women youth uh, reconciliation and uh, the peace issues and the security issues and exactly the same topics I converted and I established into the uh, I uh, put it in uh, within the Yaga foundation and I given that platform to the group of the about the 17 women, I'm sorry, there is no man still working in the Fiaga Foundation. Don't blame me for that. <laughs> it's not me to be blamed for that. Uh, and uh, that I given them the platform where my role there is uh, pro bono, and I given that platform uh, in one way to start supporting the community indirectly. But from the other side is that I want to build a future leaders for Kosovo. That's great. So any further questions, please raise your hand. And I see many, so may, maybe over here. Oh, there's a gentleman over here. Hi, thank you for doing this talk. Um, earlier this morning and today, you've talked about your support for the marginalized communities of Kosovo and your dedication to reconciliation. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how your work towards um, reconciliation of these marginalized groups, including them in government and community, and then also um, your work to kind of bring the cohesion of the multi-ethnic groups of Kosovo together. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Kosovo, it's uh, one of the unique countries in the region when we speak about the equal rights and the obligation across the board for all citizens. By the constitution of Kosovo, each, all citizens of Kosovo enjoy equal rights and equal obligation. Uh, being that 90% of the Kosovo are Albanian, or being 10% of the Kosovo Serb, Kosovo Roma, Kosovo Ashkali, Kosovo Turkish, Bosniak, Montenegrin, Croat, or whatever, even if you are 0.01%, you will enjoy equal rights and obligation by the constitution of Kosovo. One of the biggest strengths that Kosovo always had for the decades in the role I speak is itself the composition and the multi-ethnicity of Kosovo. By purpose, during the wartime, uh, they try to kind of like spin something else, but we kind of like jumped at that immediately after the end of the war. And we kind of like uh, extended our uh, like we reached out towards all the community groups to bring them ba back on board and not to allow that uh, percentage of the loss of trust that the color was given during the war time and in order that each and every one of them uh, is and should be an equal citizen of uh, Kosovo. And that is being represented across the board at the municipality level, at the government level. As I mentioned, on not only women and youth, we have a deputy prime minister which is of the minority community we have ministers which are of the minority community. We have 10% of the uh, parliament member, members of the parliament 
who belong to the uh, uh, Serb minority community and uh, the other percentage uh, beyond the 10%, which are other minority communities which are directly elected by their uh, people uh, uh, there. And politically speaking, uh, back in 2011, we have started the, uh, the political dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia because we do have a lot of unsolved issues uh, from our uh, uh, past. I have mentioned a few of them, but I didn't mention uh, others. Uh, under the facilitation of the European Union and supported uh, strongly by the United States. A lot of the agreement has been reached to the technical level, uh, which is in a way will be leading us to the further normalization of the relation between Kosovo and Serbia, uh, which we are hoping that that would be leading to the final act of uh, the, first of all, of the Serbia finally accepting about the crimes that they have and the genocide that they have, they have conducted towards the innocent citizens of Kosovo because that is a starting point for the long-lasting peace, not only between uh, Kosovo and Serbia, but, but for the entire region of the southeastern part of the Europe. Because I was speaking about only about the crimes in Kosovo, but we should not forget about uh, the uh, crimes and genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the, uh, Croatia, where uh, that we have over uh, two, uh, our 300,000 uh, people that has lost their lives within not uh, bigger than over uh, 10 million population of Kosovo, of Bosnia, uh, uh, Croatia, of, uh, of Bosnia, and uh, uh, Kosovo. And so uh, uh, reconciliation is a very long process. Trust in self is a very long process. So we are in a good path to that. Uh, but we are still very far where we're supposed to be as the countries in that, but, but also as a region. And uh, I also want to rely, I will go a little bit without trying to be misunderstood and try to be uh, more diplomatically correct on that. Uh, I think the time has come that we have uh, to uh, change a little bit approach, particularly from the uh, international community perspective towards the Serbia itself. Uh, it, I think it has been enough of the carrots there. I think the time has come that they have to be uh, playing more of the sticks there and making Serbia more stick to the obligation that they have uh, into the relation to all of the countries in the region. Uh, when they started the process of the dialogue, when they signed those agreements, they should implement those agreements, they should stick to this agreement, and they should meaning on the normalization that will open the path to the uh, uh, mutual recognition, but the mutual recognition precondition is accepting the crimes that they have conducted in Kosovo. So far, they haven't done, neither with Croatia, neither with Bosnia, and definitely not with Kosovo, and that is the high time for that. Thank you for that. Uh, there was a question over there, please. Good afternoon, uh, Madam President. I hope you're doing well. Uh, my question to you is, uh, do, you, do you believe that by the end of this, this decade, at least, the uh, uh, Republic of Kosovo achieves full recognition from all the United Nations member countries? And if it's possible, how can we achieve that using the proper, responsible, democratic manner? And especially uh, keeping in mind about the geopolitics of today's world, where a country like Russia has reintroduced physical warfare to bring about uh, regime change in countries like Ukraine or Georgia. And uh, I've been also reading about that there are increasing Serbian threats from the northern uh, border of Kosovo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, mm, well, since the declaration of the independence of the Kosovo, as a matter of fact, just last week, we have uh, uh, made 15 years of the declaration of the independence of Kosovo. Over 120 uh, countries around the world has uh, recognized the uh, independence of Kosovo, which is beyond the half of the uh, world. Yes, it's true, we are still not a member state of the uh, United States. Uh, of the, uh, we are still not a member state of the United Nations. Uh, though we are in the uh, right track to that process because Kosovo has uh, moved uh, quite a long way uh, even by being a full member of many of the regional and international organizations around the world. Uh, 
I think we came in a different stage, particularly like in the reference, like you are mentioning and now, that uh, the uh, system and the concept that we, uh, at the global level, uh, and the many leaders around the world that has been adopted so far, has shown not to be very successful, that of the exclusive approach rather than inclusive approach. Uh, and I think now is the high time that we, as leaders around the world, we should reflect on this and start uh, changing our policy, no matter how big or how small you are. At the end of the day, we are facing with the same challenges and with the same uh, 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 with consequences. And as inclusive as we are, that we will be much more able to serve uh, the best way uh, and the best capacity that we can to our citizen, being as small country as it is Kosovo, being a big country like is uh, the U.S. and uh, others. And the relation of the uh, uh, of the uh, war with the Ukraine, yes, definitely that has uh, quite of the consequences uh, in the close neighborhood, uh, but also in a much uh, uh, wider uh, concept. And we are yet to see more consequences uh, out of that war, uh, economically, financially, and other uh, 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 consequences in that uh, uh, regard. Uh, but in the relation of Kosovo, um, I think uh, Kosovo is uh, quite well set uh, because uh, uh, Kosovo has a very strong uh, alliance and the French uh, friendship with uh, many countries uh, around the world, uh, particularly within the strong powers. And uh, uh, by the resolu resolution 1244, uh, Kosovo's uh, external borders are being protected by the NATO troops uh, 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 and uh, the soldiers which are physically present in uh, uh, Kosovo. And to all of those countries and the uh, organization which still have a doubts about uh, making the step forward for recognizing the new reality of Kosovo or in that part of the southeastern part of the Europe, I think the answer is very clear. Is the verdict of the International Court of Justice uh, where uh, uh, Declaration of Independence of Kosovo did not violate none of the international laws and the Kosovo's case is the sui generis uh, case and I still kind of like don't uh, understand why the countries are still raising the questions about uh, recognizing and non-recognizing Kosovo, where the case is pretty clear on that. Thank you. So we have uh, one final question. Uh, if we could keep the question short, <laughs> and then <laughs> I can't ask Madam President to keep the answer short. So um, <laughs> indirectly, is telling me like keep the answer short. <laughs> President Yahyaga, thank you so much for being here, Please. sharing your experiences, insights. Um, my question to you is, what has been the challenges of building and preserving democracy in Kosovo, especially for the youth during a period when there's a global decline in democracy in the world backsliding year after year consecutively? Yeah. Uh, well, the biggest challenge was and continues to be how to not allow the brain drain, uh, how to create uh, more educational opportunities for the young people, more uh, job opportunities, and attracting uh, more foreign direct investment in uh, uh, Kosovo, and uh, removing as much as possible these uh, black clouds around Kosovo, which are dominant, above Kosovo, which are mainly dominant due to the bad PR, which is not necessarily related to the daily uh, reality in Kosovo, and trying to uh, give and pre present to the rest of the world what is actually the real Kosovo. The real of Kosovo is this. Is this Teuta, like she open this discussion uh, today that she had a golden opportunity to be uh, uh, through the uh, fund of the Kayev to be educated in the Georgetown and to come back and invest in Kosovo. And so that has been and continues to be to the certain point the burning also for the current government but indirectly also for us where we lobby not in a way 
uh, affecting the career of the young people, but we need them more in Kosovo, like others they need in other countries. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I actually will ask the final question myself, because <laughs> earlier uh, we had the pleasure of meeting, among other people, uh, Secretary, uh, former Governor Sibelius. And she told me, you know what you should ask, Madam President? You have had a woman president in Kosovo. There's a second woman president. When do you think there will be a woman president in the United States? Um, I'm really hoping soon. Uh, I consider myself a lucky that I lived, operated, and had the, the state of Kosovo in the era of two great women that, without any reservation, uh, I say that they are not only, they were and they are one, uh, my closest friends and mentors, Secretary Albright, that she's not among us anymore, and Secretary Clinton. This country had a golden opportunity I don't want to be politically misunderstood here because for someone which is totally neutral from uh, my political uh, background, uh, but I speak more from the gender perspective, that back in 2016, I was physically in the US and I participated in some of the uh, 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 events at that time. And before reading the book, What Happened, of Secretary Clinton that time, I asked my que myself a question. What actually happened in this country that I, was, I personally looked it up as the zenith of democracy for the world, where over 40% of the white American women did not wo vote for a woman candidate. Brings me to another point, Chandram, here, without trying to, be, to take much of the long time. We women sometimes have a tendency to be the biggest enemies of our own kind. The biggest criticisms when I took over the office, did not come from the man's. Man, I'm sorry, they don't know what is the makeup. <laughs> Man, they don't know what are the nail polish. Definitely not the high heels, shoes, bags, other things. Women are the one that knows this. They started. And with the, when this platform has been offered without even being asked towards a man, men took it, capitalized, and start hitting me even harder to that. To the women in this audience, and virtually, please stick to each other. Don't think only about yourself. Think about generations before you, and especially after you. It's in our moral obligation. If I made one step forward, my niece, which is only eight years old, is going to make 200 steps before me, because it was my obligation to uphold that platform for her, and I'm happy that I did that now in Kosovo is not question mark. Actually, it's more of a taboo to have a woman bus driver than to have a woman president. No, I seriously mean it's not an issue anymore because that taboo has been uh, already broken in there. And my second advice that I want to leave, the young people in general, it's here, because we are in university campus. I expect that this kind of question is being asked because I usually have this kind of question. What would be the advice for the young people? There is nothing that cannot be done in this world. Don't allow anyone ever 
ever in your life say to you that you cannot do that, that that is not for you. Choose something different. Choose something softer. Something that you can have an easier life, more paid life than others. Choose something that you feel that you want to do that. That you can give the maximum out of that. And don't you ever, ever, ever compromise with the values that you stand for. I haven't done that. Never in my life. Not even for the minor things. It made me go extra miles, definitely. It made me go to that level, it's like, it's impossible to get through. But it was possible, anyway. Thank you so much. I think uh, it's time to thank Madam President for, for your... <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you, thank you all for being here with us and those online as well. And I invite you to join us again next week when we continue our third and final discussion in our series focusing on Kosovo and building democracy in the 21st century. I would like to thank you again, Madam President. It's been an honor. And thank you, the Dole Institute. See you soon. Thank you so much.